are to join two experts on IPv6 networks and we are going to speak on the IPv6 only tutorial. We will try to cover four topics. I hope these are interesting and those of you who have been in our tutorials before, well, we always try to add new topics. For today's tutorial, we are going to address two new topics. The new ones are prefix delegation, HSPv6 PD, and recursive DNS behind NAT64. We have two great topics, CDC and NAT64, particularly that topic. I want to thank experts joining us today. I will introduce them, Jose Gregorio Tuba, Gia Wright, and Wesley Correa. So the objective of this tutorial is to enhance the use of, of IPv6. For some time now, we are focusing on the IPv6 only world, which we know there is a trend the globe is taking. So during the entire tutorial, <clears throat> both people here in the room and people online, please, there is a microphone, so you can raise your hand. And when asking the question, please introduce yourself. I am such and such. I come from this or other company whatever you want to say and of course i will try to provide the best answer possible so we will have this session until 1 1 p.m So, today it's my turn to talk about two different topics. First, I'm going to speak of recursive uh, DNS behind NAT64, and after that, I'm going to discuss routing in, in a native manner of IPv6 uh, and IPv4. I, IPv4 prefixes in IPv6 networks. So we're going to, to talk about this. It might sound a bit complex, DN, uh, recursive DNS behind uh, NAT64. We're going to see that it's not so complicated. This is based on an IETF uh, draft. You have the link there. 
The author is uh, a lady called Momoka, and as a matter of fact, several vendors have already implemented this support among their tools. For instance, bind, bind, they already have them. So let me tell you a bit of the background, because they're nice stories. A day like today, 50 years ago, May 15, 1974, five uh, years, uh, 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 50 years and one day, Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn, considered uh, the uh, forefathers of the internet, prepared a paper called A Protocol for Packet Network Intercommunication. And if we read it, and yesterday I had a look at it, it's basically how the internet is working today. It's crazy to see how the packet switching concept uh, between uh, IPv4 and IPv6, the packet concept was quite popular. Gateway host uh, retransmission. If uh, something gets lost, uh, the uh, uh, receipts and all those, uh, the uh, packet switching and all those things were described 50 years old ago already. So I, I wanted to mention this milestone. So I told you the topic, recursive DNS behind, uh, um, well, uh, um, NAT64. Of IP before IPv6. I'm, I'm going to explain what NAT64 is, but later uh, Wesley Korea will discuss it more in depth. Uh, um, the nice thing about this is that we touch upon a number of topics. If we uh, talk about, well, we're going to talk about DNS and NAT, NAT64, uh, IPv4, IPv6, uh, a number of topics that in the end. As a result, you get a solution that you, many of you may find appealing because it can help you save IPv4 addresses. That is basically the goal of many of you. So this is what we are going to discuss today. So I'll be excessively brief because you all know this. What is a DNS? the domain name server or domain name sister. Basically, it's like uh, um, uh, the address uh, uh, notepad uh, of the internet. When I speak uh, a domain, uh, www.something.com, whatever, that domain name is translated into an IP address. So that is what basically DNS does. The importance of DNS, I think it's not even necessary to say it, but as a matter of fact, in many times when we conduct uh, surveys among internet providers and we ask them, which is your most important service, DNS is very frequently their answer. So because uh, that uh, will enable all uh, their clients uh, um, uh, run the internet, uh, and uh, if if this doesn't work, it's a disaster. So I think that this is extremely important. So this is a very old picture, but it gives you a good example of what the internet would be if we hadn't uh, DNS. For instance, if Maria wants to enter the web uh, Pedro's web server and there's no DNS, there's a a phone call and, and she asks her what is your IP address and then Maria should uh, spell the entire address uh, to get uh, uh, Pedro's uh, web server and of course you are losing many characteristics that uh, could offer HTTP together with the DNS. Uh, so now let's go a bit uh, beyond that. What is a recursive DNS? Well, we need to have this in the ray under the radar because I'm going to mention it many, many times uh, this morning. Basically, a recursive DNS draws uh, the information from name servers uh, responding to clients' queries. This is des described in RFC 1034. Initially, uh, there was a project to translate uh, many documents from English to Spanish. This is one of them. And so if we look at the next look at the next row, let me get the pointer. Oh, good idea. I just wanted to point, uh, uh, do you have the laser pointer? So in the next row, it says it receives 
queries, name, class, type, and a bit in the DNS header that's called RD. This is recursion decide. That is, when a customer requests a DNS to a server and, uh, and gets that bit, uh, they ask it to do recursion. That is, uh, to be able to have recursive properties. It could be the DNS servers that receives this query. I need uh, to I need a, a recursive uh, address and uh, so the answer. And here I want to pause because we are going to focus on this recursive DNS servers. We are going to explain this in detail. Of course, you have uh, the concept of the caches. Uh, we know that. And if Jordi Palette comes and uh, conducts a query in the DNS server, probably uh, if a minute later somebody else uh, asks the same thing, uh, it will be in the cache and, and it will be drawn directly from the cache. So this it's important to understand how important the DNS is. We're going to go through this very quickly. Remember that you can conduct queries to me or to them. If I don't know the answer, I look for Wesley or Kutule, Jordi. So what would we do? What's the heavy work that a recursive DNS server has? When we speak of a, DNS, a recursive DNS, this gentleman here, the blue box to your left, we are speaking, for instance, of the DNS server that is receiving all its clients in the cable and fiber upon uh, satellite uh, um, uh, connections or whatever. And through an HTTP, you enter a, a DNS server in uh, the IPv6. You can uh, uh, render it uh, through roadman advertisement on RA. But the truth is that here, to your left, the resolver will have those uh, it to be uh, already configured to know where the queries are. So I, I have to go to Wikipedia, to Google, to Yahoo. So here I send the query to know uh, the destination. So that is the recursive server that you have there. So this resolver specifically, the DNS router is called the stop resolver. It's, it's a very uh, gross resolver, very small library. So it sends query. It has no power whatsoever for any smart decisions, which is not the case of the recursive DNS server. So what's happening here? The resolver down at the bottom, uh, at the bottom to your left, sends a query to the recursive uh, DNS server that goes from the ISP. So what is the query? Here it's called uh, Fuji 6 uh, ASO.FR. This is known R as RR resource record. And so it tells, well, recursive uh, uh, server, I need you to solve what appears here. So the recursive uh, DNS that's much smarter and uh, is capable of making decisions based on uh, any situations they may find goes to the internet, starting with the route servers looking for the answer. So, so the root servers go and say something. Uh, the, and because the root servers only have information, the concept information of the top level domain, the TLC, the TLD. Uh, dot uh, net dot com uh, dot uh, pa dot co uh, dot br and so on and so forth. That's what they know. So they can't give you the full answer of uh, um, g6 aso dot fr. So what will it tell the recurse of DNS? Well, he'll say, well, you know, I don't have your full answer, but I do know which are the DNS servers that are capable of uh, solving the dot .fr. So this gentleman here goes to the uh, FR name server. Of course, there may be several, because in the road servers there are 13. All of them have IPv6, and uh, they are in any cast. So uh, this gentleman, the recursive uh, DNS server, will hit 
more than once to respond to the final uh, equipment, the resolver. And there's a very important thing. It is that a resolver uh, at the bottom, uh, left, at left, must always get a response. When you see, when, when a client complains that the internet is slow or that something is wrong, probably the resolver may have a blocked response. And unfortunately, the client will be in a DNS timeout. So that is what gives you the feeling that the internet is slow. And why am I showing this? Because most, by far, most DNS resolutions that you constantly um, conduct work like this. We are going to focus on this. For instance, the route servers support uh, IPv6. This, that means that if this gentleman has IPv6, I'm going to be able to reach them. However, if somebody in the final chain does not have IPv6 and this gentleman is IPv6 only, we are going to con uh, produce a rupture. So today we're going to show how we can give you this small solution so that this uh, IPv6 only gentleman can reach the rest of the internet, right? So overnight, not 64. But before going into that, we all know what NAT is. Network address translation, it's basically the translation of source IPv4 addresses in IPv4 from a private address to a public IP address that will serve online. The picture shows to the left three computers with private IP addresses. 1.2, 1.3, connected to a switch, and they will go through a router. A router will translate that private IP addresses to the public IPv4 address, 202.4511, and reach the public internet. That's what the NAT does. It translates from one IP to another. Now, what happens? with transition mechanisms. People who work a lot with the IPv6 world know that transition mechanisms are sorted in three ways. Dual stack, IPv4, IPv6. Some purists even don't consider that a transition mechanism. Other call, others call it tunneling. I'm sure you're familiar with. You have a IPvC datagram on IPv4 transported and uh, group them in the, in the target, and others are translation. Now, 64, as such, is a mechanism. It's a transition mechanism in the translation world. Why is that important? IPv4 and IPv6, by default, cannot communicate. If I am an IPv4 host, I cannot communicate natively with IPv6. I need a middle layer for us to communicate. Now, this type of communication is not possible. Therefore, I need the translation. So what do we translate? Well, you translate the header that you can see on screen to the left is IPv4 and to the right is IPv6. When we speak about night 64, very briefly, because Wesley will go more in depth, what we're saying is translating the header to the left to the one that we can see on the right. The IPv4 header has more fields and on the IPv6 is a larger header, but simpler. So very generally speaking, an example of a translation, I have to the left an IPv4 host 192.0.2.1 that needs to reach IPv6 only to our right. So I can take that router, route the package, re reach IPv6 only just simply because the other host won't be able to do anything with that package. So what happens? 
So we have layer two, layer three, four, seven. At the layer two level, it's the same mechanism that we have on the IPv4, IPv6 world with no translation. I have a Mac, a source Mac and target right here. It comes out 111, 222. The target receives the router, Mac 222. It will route it through this interface. So at the second layer phase, the source Mac and the target Mac. So far, so good. IPv4, native IPv4, or 6. At the layer 3 is where the magic happens. So let's just pay attention here. The tra NAT64 translation happens at layer 3. We won't modify layer 7, probably not layer 4. That would be source, port, target, port. That's not too complicated either. But look at layer 3. I have my source host address and now the target, it will think that the target has a 10.0.0.4 IP. So from this host's perspective, we are communicating with an IPv4. The router will take it and at the third layer, it will have the source IPv6 address maintain the address, the IPv6 target address, and this is what it will write here when it receives the package. It will find or it will think it's IPv6, I can respond, we can connect and communicate through the ports, non-privileged ports one, uh, 6123. The target is 80, I need a web server on this site. The data, it says, well, hello, and that stays as hello while the package is in transit. Remember that you can just raise your hand if you have any questions. So what happens with the local link address IPv6? So it's not translated. We are not created a local link. Thank you for your question. The Gentlemen, ask what happens with link local addresses on IPv6. These are mandatory addresses that will have all the interfaces. What would happen? Well, in this case, we're not translating it. It stays the same. Each interface that we see on the IPv6 side to your right. Will remain. The router will have its local. This target will have the link local, its own link local. Thank you for your question. And let me build on that. The next part of my presentation, I will speak about link local. And that's important. Link locals are mandatory addresses. In general, we'll start by 80. That's how you need to start. And what's the scope? What is the scope of a link local address? Only the VLAN where I can, where I am the LAN where I am are not going to be routed in that sort of things. Now, I want you to know that those are mandatory. So let me just give you a brief example before I just show you the result as we go. We cannot connect, I had said, this IPv6 host to this IPv4 host. However, we are adding a component. We are adding a NAT64 equipment. Here, in this example, the host to your bottom left will communicate to the host of the uh, top left, IPv6, IPv4. What's happening? 
host, this host, how does communication begin? We send a query to the DNS. Now, this gentleman sent a query to a DNS server, a special DNS server. Why? Because it's DNS 64. And we will speak about this in a minute. Now, this one over here receives a query. Example.com, it's IPv6. Go into the authoritative DNS server. Authoritative servers are those servers that have the authority to provide an answer on a name. For example, DNS servers, lacnic.net, servers are authoritative servers to provide responses. If you ask google.com, you might get their reply, but they are not the authority over that domain. So we'll go to the authoritative domains, for example, .com. Now what happened? This gentleman over here only has an IPv4 address. That means this host, bottom left, cannot communicate with example.com. Why? Because IPv6, but the target is IPv4. Now, the magic will happen because DNS64 will synthesize that address, that target address, IPv4 only, in this address, 64, column FF, 9B, column, column, and what we can see in red is just the IPv4 target address synthesized. And that is the response that DNS64 will send to the IPv6 only host. When that happens, from its perspective, it is accessing a target that is also IPv6, or that's what it thinks. And we will also reach, and this is the routing part, the DNS says, fine, I need to reach this destination, this target, let's go. The host says, okay, I will use whatever route I have for gateway for this destination, it's received by NAT64, thanks to this code for IP address, this is a well-known prefix, the, it knows that I need to remove those first digits of the address for the target IPv6 address. I remove the first 96 bits and I keep the last 32, which is the IPv4 address. So far, so good. It removes, it does whatever not it needs to do for uh, an IPv4 source address of IPv4 source address, of course, we reach this example.com. It gets the response and it's all wonderful. Communication is great. When the packet comes back, it has a state table in the memory, knowing the origin and the communication with the target. On the way back, I need to do this counterpart. So the host that started the communication can actually access example.com. So my friend here will describe it more in depth. So what is the situation nowadays? The situation is that IPv6 only network deployment, and this is taken from the draft, is becoming more widespread. There are more deployments of IPv6 only. At LACNIC, we are sort of pushing or supporting our, our, our courses really target IPv6 only networks. The material we're publishing online is IPv6 only. We have technical material focused on IPv6 only, DNS IPv6 only, RGB IPv6 only. We are just about to publish a, a monitoring one on IPv6 only networks because really we trust that, that is the way to go. And actually, big companies, big CDNs are having their data centers on IPv6 only, and this is nothing new. Now, on the edges, they will create some sort of table to map IP addresses, IPv4 public, to my then IPv6 only data center to reach my IPv6 servers. Now, there are many challenges to this. One is the DNS world, and we found a solution for this. So we're going to combine this all, and I know I'm saying too many things. Now, what's the problem? The problem is 
and now speaking about an IPv6 only DNS. I have here my host, IPv6 only. I want to resolve the IEEE.org. This is a name server that has configured only IPv4. So now what happens? We run it. The DNS server that we have on IPv6 only has a root server. No problem. Three root servers, all IPv6. It goes to Aphelias. Aphelias is the one that manages name servers for .org. Great. They have IPv4, IPv6. And since they have IPv6, this host is able to reach them. Great so far. Now, what happens next? The I triple E servers, the final part of the resolution is only IPv4. Of course, this gentleman over here won't be able to reach it. I reviewed this yesterday and this is still the case. Now, what is the result? IPv6 only having it behind a NAT64. We have all of these concepts right here that we have reviewed already, so let's see what happened. This is the final solution. I think that many of you knew what the final answer uh, was based on what I said before, but it is good to know the concept so everyone's on the same page. So basically, the solution shows an IPv6. I have a recursive interactive server that is IPv6 only, but I have this new NAT64 box. This box, of course, will provide this gentleman over here the capability of reaching the IPv4 world and authoritative DNS servers on IPv4, and that is wonderful. Now, this gentleman over here, I don't have to use IPv uh, for addressing and other headaches behind it. We will have a small demo, each one of us, and, and nothing <coughs> is uh, interrupted. If you are preoccupied because we are concerned because we are breaking DNS 6, no. This nothing only happens at layer 3. I'm not modifying anything. I might be saving IPv4 addresses, which is an advantage of having a 100% IPv6 only network. We use about stack management use. You might have some sort of IPv6 only network, which creates many advantages. I have a dual stack. I have a host and I have to look at the firewall on that host if IPv4 or 6 on the network, whether I modify or add new services, I have to update the policies for each one of my devices. But behind all of that, there's a lot of work, a lot of hard work in managing those dual stacks. So we can add, uh, well, <clears throat> in very modern uh, uh, machines, uh, the PCUs not so much, but uh, in the end we are uh, using up some uh, memory. Um, and zip back and zip it is okay. And here, uh, now, the, here there's a security issue because uh, if it's dual stack, uh, they can uh, uh, attack me from IPv4 or IPv6. If I have a, only one stack, the attack will come only by one of the stacks. So let's see a brief demo. Let's see, let's try with these domains very quickly. Let's see what happens. Just a second. Okay. So very briefly. I have uh, two SH uh, sessions. Let's capture some traffic to see the resolution. This server has unbound. Okay. 
Este, vamos a buscar esta configuración. So, this uh, configuration specifically has these entries that I'd like to mention. It has uh, a directive that's called do not 64. Basically, we turn it on, we put yes, we enable it, and in addition, we have this directive that is the NAT64 prefix. This is the well-known prefix. However, some operators may have the power to use uh, one of their own prefixes. That's absolutely feasible. So basically, what we are doing with this directive is we are telling Unbound, please, when the destination is IPv6 only, just leave it like that. If the destination is IPv4, please use NAT64. So you are with a machine that can do NAT64. And in the prefix, please use this one. In a slash 64, this is very popular, a slash 64, because if I add 64 plus 32 of an IPv4 prefix, I will reach 128. So let's see whether what I'm saying works. So let's try abc.com.py. Paraguay. As a matter of fact, well, this may happen. I picked uh, four different countries, so you won't think that I'm biased. There is a long list. They are conducting statistics. Uh, there are statistics study. We'll show that on Thursday. But here I picked just uh, four different ones. It's not our fault. They always ask us, well, if where did you take that domain from? There's a sample that is called Majestic Million. It's the, it, it picks uh, the million most uh, popular uh, domains, and we took uh, the, the ones with the TLDs in our region, and then we found the DNS servers associated to the domain that had IPv4, and IPv4. we tried to, to determine whether they had IPv4 or IPv6, and he, these have only DNS associated to IPv4. So, let's try. For instance, abc.com.py. Dig is a very famous tool for DNS queries, so I'm going to tell uh, well, query ask the local host uh, server because it's unbound, so it may be anywhere. And I'm going to say, well, show me the NS servers associated to py to dot py. Notice that here we have a simple result. It's telling me that it has two DNS servers associated. And we were so fortunate that uh, the concept of uh, record uh, worked and it brought me the IPv4 addresses associated. So it's, it has no IPv6 addresses. Our DNS server being IPv6 only will not be capable of resolving this. Let's see. I'm, I'm telling, bring a registry, a, this, a corresponds to address, I be for address, so I like dig, and what I like about it is that I can see quickly whether there was a response or not. So this was the question, and, and www.abc.com.py and the address and then the answer section is here. So basically what it's showing, you can do it with one or more domains, uh, additional domains and then switch gears. Let's go with pe.gov.br. So um, come here. PE dot uh, uh, 
Gov. Uh, we are and uh, pr please bring the DNS and these are IP4 addresses. So we, we see that it has IP4 only once again. So DNS server won't be able to reach the native address. Time out. It's taking too long. Time out. I don't know whether it's a server or this specific domain. So, processal.cl. Let's check processal.cl, if I'm not wrong. There it is, processal.cl. In this case, the link servers are ns2.a2hosting.com, and we can check whether these gentlemen have IPv4 or IPv6. Let's, let's uh, embellish the query. And here, I'm going to write what we are including. We are telling it Dig, give me a short answer for a query of this uh, name domain here. So, in the DNS that you're going to use uh, is. Uh, yourself and you're going to bring uh, an IPv6 uh, registry so it's blank so basically it's telling me that in NS2 it's going to tell me whether it has something and it did it didn't have something so this uh, DNS server has IPv4 but not DNS6 uh, IPv6 so let's see NS4 it doesn't have it and let's do just one more NS3 none of them have IPv6 so, let's see whether in the server we can resolve it. Bingo! It's telling me that indeed I can resolve this domain in spite of the fact that the servers are IPv6 only. So, let's go to the next topic in your shoes. Imagine that many of you may have done it you have your ipv6 deployed and you are delivering your clients dns service in an ipv6 world no problems you i'm going to put a recursive dns behind nat64 and you assign by ra this kind of server for instance so this server well, it has all the advantages that you may have in an IPv6 world, but without losing traceability in the IPv4 world, that in the end is what we all want. Any questions about this before we go to the DNS and to the next topic? Okay. So when B, uh, when point uh, dot B are failed, well, we'll see what we got with all the other queries so we have a second give me a second so that I can prepare the rest Um, 
Buenos días. Mientras que Alejandro. Good morning. While Alejandro gets ready for the next topic, now I'm going to ask a question to further explain what he just explained. And if, if the DNS server behind a, DN, a, a NAT64, because we know that there are several uh, uh, servers bind and bomb, whether they always need adjustments to conduct a query through NAT64. So that will be the question just uh, to use this time. So the answer is, indeed, you can. It's uh, affirmative. So we need the DNS server, in this case, the bound by, to support the command lines that I mentioned, so that it will say, well, when I'm going to uh, an IPv4 only destination, I'm going to get a slash 96 and do the append of uh, the destination address of 22 bits and that NAT64 may remove it, but you have to tell the DNS server that is capable of doing that. Thank you, Jose. Could you use the mic, please? Alejandro, the DNS needs to be dual stuck for that recursion? Thank you. No. The DNS server is IPv6 only. And for communicating with IPv4, well, we have the NAT64 in front. Thanks to NAT64, it can communicate to the rest of the world. The NAT64 is not just devoted to the DNS server. Behind the NAT64, I could have another huge network in the IPv6 only world with, well, no trouble at all. Jordi Pellet. Alejandro, let me just clarify a few points. The situation, I mean, regularly. Nowadays, most DNS servers will be dual stack. That is the current situation in IETF. And what Alejandro explained is an IETF document that still not be done in our FC. It's still in process. What we are doing is sort of anticipating to the future where there will not even be IPv4 addresses or enough addresses or where we won't want to set up DNS servers for dual stack. So we're anticipating to what's coming. Now, the reality is that today what we recommend is just use your DNS servers with dual stack whenever possible. Otherwise, that is the solution. Right, that is an additional solution to whoever needs it. If your IPv4 routing is difficult and you feel like if I well, use it here, I will save uh, sessions in the NAT. Well, that, that is feasible. That is doable. Daniel Paniagua from Costa Rica. My question is, this NAT64 will be configured only in recursive DNS servers. I do not have to set anything up on authoritative. That is correct. When I have authoritative, not necessarily, but it's most likely that the authoritative will be at least dual stack. What you already said is very clear. Many recommendations say that DNS servers need to be on dual stack. Of of course, what is great is that you can simulate dual stack. You can have an IPv6 only on the server, and one way or another, you can have a static NAC64 and AEM uh, tables. Wesley will speak about this. And from the world's perspective, this will be dual stack. Did you want to add anything? We have a question from Henry. So end users don't know if the DNS is only v4. So we always recommend as a best practice that when we have a device, an IoT with IPv6 only, only uses NAT64. Well, in the IoT world, for IPv6, I mean, this would be a good solution. It would be a good fit. And, and thank you, Henry, for your comment. 
Okay, let's move on. Let's speak about other techniques. Another technique that I personally like because it is a translation based technique. We will achieve native routing of IPv4 prefixes in IPv6 only networks. I like the native routing part of it. Well, 50 years of that paper, I just mentioned this before. Here, we need to go back to the past. We need to go back and to think what things were like 10, 15 years ago and remember what uh, MPBGP means, multi protocol BGP. So, did you know that we could publish IPv6 prefixes on a BGP session that was established on B4? Great, that is feasible, and vice versa. I can have a, se a BGP session established in V6 and publish a V4 prefix, and that's what we will do today. That is possible, thank you, to versatil versatility of the multi protocol BGP. If you do that, that is terrible. It's horrible, it's not scalable. And if I need to troubleshoot, well, that'd be great. I will just call in sick and not even show up to the office because it's horrible. It can be done, but it's terrible. There are some examples here. They're not complete, but this is what happened many years ago. You could have a declared neighbor on IPv6. I could have an address family, an IPv4 address family. The neighbor's active. In IPv4 address family, although it's an IPv6 neighbor, and I'll just publish networks. That is doable. To our right, we'll see the counterpart the other way around. It's horrible. You have to go through a roadmap, have the mandatory attribute in the BGP world, next hop. It's quite horrible. I only saw one person doing it once. This is what we cannot do. Just please don't go around saying that Alejandro told us to do it. So RFCA 950 to the rescue. What does the document say? It's the 559 evolution and have the same title. Advertising IPv4 network layer reachability information as an, X, as an IPv6 next hub. In BGP world, there are many mandatory attributes. The next hub is a mandatory attribute. What we are doing, we are advertising IPv4 network layer reachability. We are announcing IPv4 prefixes on BGP sessions on IPv6. So how does it work? So we can just jump to the demo. When opening the BGP session, we negotiate a new capability called extended next hub encoding. That is the name of the capacity. We discover they involve routers. Discover, this is a word that for many of us on BGP might drive us crazy. What do you mean we discover? In the BGP world, those routers are not discovered. I define which one it is, they discover who am I, but it's 2024. So there are many techniques for the BGP world for neighbors to self-discover. That's in the data center world, it's quite popular, but I would say it's not normal. So BGP and TCP sessions, we exchange BGP tables, IPv4, prefixes on v6 networks using the link local as an attribute someone asked this uh, in the uh, other presentation so how do we get there how does it work how do we get there so bgp is a protocol that works at the application level on tcp so from the planet's perspective bgp is like same http ftp sch dns it's a protocol at the application layer so we saw number two already, a BGP update from a V6 prefix could be transported on V4. And the third one's the key to make it happen. 
routers. Well, so you are sending the packet from our computer, the Wi-Fi router receives it. What's happening be behind it? You open Google.com, and at the third layer level, we have well connecting to Google. And what happens on layer two? Well, the MAC address of that router, and that's the magic of it all and how we'll manage to get that routing in a very short period of time. Now, with regards to the BGP capacities, well, basically the capacities, what do I support? What do you support? That's why in the BGP world, we always say that BGP is a protocol that does backward compatibility. You might have a router that is 10 year old. I might have a new one. I might have more capacity than you, but when we communicate, when we establish the BGP communication, we'll negotiate capacities and we will communicate as we can. If I were to ask Wesley, what language do you speak? Well, I speak English, Portuguese, and Spanish. I only speak English and Spanish. So we will communicate in either English or Spanish. I will not speak Portuguese because I myself don't support that capacity. Now, having said that, here are some print screens some screen grabs you have the open message for bgp that has this right here this is the open message i will explain this in a minute here in the bgp world there are only four types of messages open update and this is important to remember we'll see it in a minute open to open the session of course the bgp session itself update is a message where i can send routing information i can tell you which networks i know i can also tell you which ones i knew i used to know it but not anymore that is an update message notification it's an maybe an error message in the B bgp session and of course they keep alive keep alive as bgp is over tcp and these are also sessions that could be years or months uh, long to make sure that the hosts are still alive. We frequently send the keep alive messages. What else? <clears throat> right here, we are going to use an FRR free range routing suite. It is a great routing suite. It is open source based on Linux. And by default, they send RA packets. These are router advertising packets. Our, so in through this RA, we're going to send the MAC of the RA routing. There's a screen graph here of how capabilities are negotiated. What else do I have here? Well, this is basically what well, top right, what you'll see top right is a routing table of an IPv6 only router. And uh, to your left, you have a trace route and it all works uh, fine. Much of what we're going to say is based on uh, this uh, book, BGP in the data center. I rec really recommend it to you strongly let me share the full screen again the demo we're going to do it with gnc3 i'm going to launch these routers because it takes them a while start with this let's start this one and let me explain the topography very quickly as they get started so what do we have here very briefly in the upper part the R2 router to interfaces and I want to highlight that it's IPv6 only because the machine doesn't have IPv4. To your left you have R1 that can work with dual stack because it has one leg with one phaser with IPv4 and the other one with IPv6 addressing and to the right in 
In the case of R3, it's the same as R1. It has an interface in IPv6 and another interface in IPv4. So these two routers here, basically, I'm going to use, well, they're not routers. These are machines. I'm going to use them to do ping and trace. So let me start the other one so that all the topology is running. Let me explain this while the machines get started. So we mentioned the RA concept. The packet RA in the IPv6 world means router advertisement. It's a packet within the neighboring discovery uh, protocol, the NDP. And there's there's a joke, I don't know whether you know it, but in the NTF world, they say that the routers are so, uh, uh, they boast so much in the IPv6 world that uh, they are so cocky that uh, they can, um, they, that they are so proud that uh, in five, the five, five minutes they say, I'm a router, I'm a router, I'm a router. I don't know that it's true or not. So how does this work? Well, this machine here will send RA packets through the interface that goes to R2, obviously. And R2, of course, will do the same because it's a router. FRR, all the routers by default are sending RA packets. That's the way how these, for instance, R1 and R2 and later on R2 and R3 are going to discover themselves, self-discovery. So I'm in R1. Too ugly. Okay, that's okay. I'm in R1, so, so I hope uh, you see this well. I have a small file that configures the IP part. So if we see it, let's see the script I run. Basically, I put uh, an interface one with IPv6 and another one with IPv4, not even routing, and it raises the interfaces. So I'll get in. And the router. Okay. 
I'm in VTSH. That's the console. The SRR. So I'm in R1, so far so good. Let's configure it and I'm going to explain the setup. The CLI is very similar to a Cisco router. Router BGP 65001 and we are going to give the BGP router ID. We all know that the routers usually have an algorithm to look for the router ID. When we look for the highest uh, router ID uh, we got, and basically because this is defined as an IPv4, because the open message has a field, the router ID, that is a field of 32 bits. Okay, good. They will have a decent speed. So all this is part of the show. What happens? Let's go on uh, setting it up. We created the BGP process uh, with 65001, a private autonomous system. We tell the router, hey, uh, get uh, the uh, ID 1111. And there is a command that is called EBGP requires policy that basically it's to facilitate the demo so we won't have to create uh, route maps and uh, uh, routing policies. So, what did we did traditionally? You put neighbor and you both put an IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. That's what we've done many many times now now i'm going to lie i'm going to tell that the neighbor is the interface right so enp 0 s3 interface and we're going to tell it that the autonomous system what we have in this interface that these are external autonomous systems i can for some autonomous system saying that they are internal. So, and we are going to tell it the capacity it supports. So it says, this. what are the capabilities? Would this neighbor supports the capability extended next hop? It's what we just saw. And notice that obviously IPv6 will speak However, we are going to activate it uh, in uh, IPv4. So when we create uh, an IPv4 neighbor, we activate it in uh, the IPv4 uh, part. And uh, the uh, same applies to IPv6. However, I'm going to tell it to activate it here. Let's use a command. Lagnik doesn't recommend it, but it's the redistribute connected. And I'm going to explain why I'm doing this. Because what I want is R1 to redistribute the network in the IPv4 interface. It could have done it with a network command or other ways. But for today's purposes, we'll do it like this. So believe it or not, this is what uh, we have to do for this. Now let's go to router 2.
So, again, with R2, and I also have a script for the interfaces, notice that this machine only has IPv6. That's all it has. So let's re, uh, let's configure it. I go into ETH and it will do it a bit faster. Remember that if you have questions, what did you do this? Uh, just ask whatever you want. I'll be very happy to answer. So BGP six five zero zero two and uh, BGP. Uh, router I, I, ID to do, 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 do and if it, can't, if it can't discover it well the BGP address won't uh, be lifted it uh, requires no policies and we're going to tell it your neighbor is ENP 0s3 those are the names of uh, the interfaces if your Linux has a uh, bridge uh, um, uh, 01 uh, lang uh, at 30. Well, this is the name of the interface. The interface, uh, what are we doing here? Very briefly in R2, I'm saying activate neighbors through this interface and activate neighbors through this interface. So I say for ENP0S3 and ENP0S8 and the capabilities in each. Extended next stop in eight, and now we go to three. Okay. So, so what would be missing here to activate it in address family, and of course in IPv4, so that uh, the uh, um, audit messages may match. So I say neighbor ENP 0S3 activate. I, I, here I don't, and ENP OS8, here I don't have any redistributed because I don't have to do anything else. So we are ready. So uh, show IP route. And notice that I'm seeing one in the IPv4 world. Notice how interesting this is. A link local in the IPv6 world. And obviously, the administrative uh, distance in the IPv world is maintained. So we are doing OK. So now let's see router 3. So you see that the configuration is just too easy. So this is our ours. I mean the capabilities. So let's see what it has. So this is IP4 address. It has IPv6 and pseudo interfaces. Let's go to the VITCH and let's say, well, router 65003. This is the router ID3333. I always recommend that the router ID is explicitly specified because sometimes you leave that to routers. And if for some reason I have an IPv4 and I look back and I change that, I might create some stability across the network. So I always recommend that a router ID is fixed from the routing protocol similar to the SPF protocol. So neighbor, what was it? E N P zero S eight interface. <clears throat> so this is a capability. Extended next hub. And we'll also tell it for the neighbor to get and uh, that, that will get in that interface will be found in this V4 address family. So what do we have here? Show IP BGP. 
neighbors neighbor summary Oh, I, I'm missing something. We did not write the policy. Okay, it's picked up the BGP session and I am messing the redistribute so we can see it clearly. I'm missing something. Address family IPv4, redistribute connectors and activate neighbor. So redistribute connected. Sixty five hundred six five zero zero three. So that looks better. So let's see what I have on R2. I will now go to my, well, the PCs, to the clients. Let me see if I can access them both very quickly. This is quite slow today. So this is PC one. And once again, I'll have this. It only has one IPv4 address, default gateway, just one interface. And that's it. Let's see if it reached the gateway. It is. And now this other device over here did not get it. Let me see, we have time to do something else. I will restart this BGP session over here for traffic capture, so we have time. So I'm on R2. Let's just do it here on R2. Clear IP BGP. Start. So I'll pick it up here. Let's see if we can capture the packets so you can see how it works. I have the zoom screen here as well. So very quickly. Okay. 
So what's happening behind? We have an open message, a BGP open message. Sent by this router, we are capturing into its interface between R2 and R1 and R2 to see what's happening on BGP behind. So, we have the open message, version, mesh, whole time, BGP identifier, and there is a number of capabilities. So that's how they know that you can speak extended next hub. So there are several capabilities being negotiated. What we can do, what we cannot do, for example, the first one is called multi protocol extension, means that I speak uh, MGBGP and the one that I want to see now, extended next hub encoding. If we open it, you can see here number five. This, this is the one that I uh, showed in the presentation that it was a name assigned. Now refresh. Another one. Supporting four octets and so on. So this is the open message. There should be a similar one. This is router 2, so there should be another similar one from router uh, 1 to router 2. If we can capture it, that's great. But we'll also see an update message, and that's basically where the magic happens. Let me see if I can find it. One eight five bytes. I'll probably see it here. Right, this is perfect. Look right here. Let me just remove that. It's quite short. So what do I have? I have an update message. As I said earlier, there are three, ty four types of messages. Notification, which is right here, keep alive, update, and open. We're lucky because actually we can see them all right now. So what's happening <clears throat> under the equipment? Well, thanks to the multi-protocol BGP knows the AFI address family information concept, the subsequent address information, it is capable of indicating IPv4 prefixes on a BGP session on IPv6. Now, if we look at the layer 3, we'll see that the E6 protocol and this TCP, well, BGP is running on TCP on port 179, hub limit is set to 1. And what else? What else? Source, destination. At the TCP level, we'll skip that part. And this is where it gets interesting. We have an update message where I'm indicating that I want to add a route. Because it says MP reach, reachability, multi protocol reachability. N R R I network or uh, reachability information. It says I am transporting IPv4. The AFI is unicast, and this is showing the information for that prefix. And this is the layer staff. It's ten three three zero. So we know where we are, and we are running out of time. But this network. Is 3330-24 ENPS8. We use the redistribute connected command, and that started in AF65003, uh, and it told to 65002, and now 2 will tell the same information to number 1, <coughs> adding its own. 10330 uh, network, and in addition to that, we have the AS pass. 
This is also a mandatory attribute that needs to be sent in all messages. Well, I wanted to tell you how this works. Uh, it's very slow. So this is uh, flags, uh, transitive extended length, well known, complete. So here it will give us some more information. Uh, so let's go through this quickly. Uh, the link should be there. Yes. It probably it might say, and this is compensated uh, by PRR, and it will probably say unknown address in the next next hop. There. Afi, Safi, next hop, it says unknown address, but this is compensated uh, by. RA when the packet uh, is received. Uh, I have two minutes left. I need this too. Notice here, very briefly, everything worked, and now I'm in PC2. And from PC2, I can ping even to PC1. What I want you to see here is that this was a case exported many years ago. This is uh, FRC. 5,000 uh, and something, and this was supported by many, many vendors, and it all works. And the nice thing is that we are doing the routing from the PC2 host. It uh, travels all along uh, the network, e including uh, RPv6 only, and then it reaches PC1, and it goes the right way. So let's uh, do the trace path. 10, 1, 1, 2, slash, no, and, and there we see that there were four hops. Of course, the first hop is uh, this uh, 10331, it, uh, it got repeated uh, twice and then it got no reply. That is when the trace path of the trace route uh, set up in uh, the IPv4 world uh, doesn't get a reply. The three or the router one and four, that is what I'm reaching, is 10.1.1.2. So, ladies and gentlemen, we finished just on time. There might be time for one or two questions, not more than that, before we go for lunch. And please don't leave because I have a message. Housekeeping information, almost as important as lunch. <laughs> Okay. Any questions? How it works? If there's something you didn't understand, I I'm aware that we are going very fast. But um, before lunch, well, you can all take your pictures with the event banner. It's outside in the coffee break uh, hall. And you can use the Instagram filters. Please don't forget to share it with the hashtag of the event. That is uh, hashtag LACNIC41, capital letters, just one word. Lunch is here. As you leave to your right, you won't miss it. I'm sure you won't. And please, let's come back at 1. Oh, no, at 2 p.m. Panama time. Thank you.